Okay, everybody, welcome to uh, the June meeting of the Detroit area wood turners. A uh, lot of fun planned for today. Um, and a uh, lot of uh, good news coming out, or potentially good news. So I'm going to get right into it because we got a lot to cover. We got Robbo going to do our, our uh, demo for us today. It's um, good, Raymond. He's doing it from tomorrow. So. <laughs> So first off, do we have any guests or new members that, uh, um, if you could let us know who you are, uh, tell us a little bit about you, and you'll have to unmute your mic. Anybody? Well, I figured we'd have some guests because a couple people asked me if they could bring guests to this meeting. No. Okay. Um, we're going to move on to the next thing. Uh, if you haven't, Please mute your microphone uh, so we don't have any background noises and so on. Um, Glenn, if you see anybody that missed that, um, if you can mute them, that would be great. Um, we don't have our treasurer with us today. He's, uh, he's working on a job and can't make the meeting, so there will not be a treasurer's report, unfortunately. Uh, so we'll get that taken care of next month. Uh, one of the primary discussions during the social hour was Ron Campbell's hands-on retreat. And uh, if you did not make that to this year, to it this year, as soon as the announcement comes out, probably in December, get yourself signed up because it's going to book up real fast. Uh, it is the most amazing wood turning experience you will have. Uh, unlike the symposiums where you go and sit in a classroom and watch people do stuff, you are hands-on with everything, including awfully. Uh, I took a I took a, a class in pyography, which I've never done before. Um, and I'll show that a little bit later on. Um, and uh, I posted a picture of the birdhouse that I made where I was airbrushing. I am so hooked on airbrushing, it isn't funny. Um, to me, that was worth $1,000. So, uh, um, so keep your eyes open for that. I'll, I'll make sure everybody knows when it's time to uh, do sign up and everything like that. That'll come later in the year. So, but it was a great time. We were well represented. Uh, we had a couple members that could not show up at the last minute, uh, but we had eight people there. Uh, so it was great. It was all just, I mean, I don't know how else to sum it up other than it was a fun, amazing time. So, um, so that's it for that. Um, as always, just a reminder, we are looking for people to do our workshops, uh, which is generally the Saturday after our meetings. Um, so if you can do that, uh, remember that Chuck can come out and do all the video work for you so you don't have to worry about it. Or you can just set up a phone like Paul Newberger did and I did and so on. Um, so keep that in mind. Please let Cindy Yates know if you would like to do one. Uh, and don't worry if you think that it's been done before. We've had many workshops and demos that have been done over and over again. You always get a different idea from different people, different feel for things. So, uh, you know, keep that in mind. Uh, think about it and uh, let us know if you can help. Uh, as I announced uh, last uh, month, we are having a picnic. We're going to meet face to face in August. Uh, instead of a meeting, we're going to have our turnathon. It's going to be at Chuck Lobato's house. Uh, Cindy's ordered the tent, the chairs, and the tables. We are working behind the scenes to get all the fine details uh, worked out on that. And um, so there'll be more information coming down the road, but uh, that'll be the day that we have our picnic. Um, we hope to have our turning competition like we normally do. And, what day uh, is it? Uh, August 15th is going to be in place of our meeting. It's Sunday. Um, so, uh, yeah, put that in your calendars. Don't book yourself. It's at his uh, house. If, you, if you haven't been to one of our picnics, they're a lot of fun. Chuck's going to have his, uh, his sawmill set up and uh, making wood for us. So... Uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. I'm looking forward to having it again. I really missed it last year, along with meeting face to face. Uh, you know, the bottom line is 2020 just sucked, and this is going to help get us back together and uh, feeling the hope for the future. So, uh, news on the new home. It's becoming very evident that we're not going to find a place that we can meet. Uh, on our monthly meetings and have a workshop. I think it's going to end up being, we have to have two different locations. So what I'm doing right now is um, there's still some things to be negotiated, but I'm hoping by the end of this week, I'll be able to make an announcement that we have a place to meet for my, our monthly meetings starting in September. And we can meet face-to-face, -face, we can Zoom, uh, continue Zooming. 
uh, and just get back the way it was in the old days. We were all face to face and having a great time. So uh, I will send out an email to everybody once I got a handle on that. It's just, we're working out the fine details now on the contract. So, and it will be right, uh, it will be right outside of Pontiac. So it's gonna be central to everybody like the, the PCAC was. So, as I mentioned, uh, Robo uh, Robertson will be doing our, um, our demo today. And so he will be on hand at our workshop to help anybody with the SKU that needs it or answer any questions. The one caveat to that is the workshop will not be next Saturday like we normally have it. It'll be the following Saturday on June 26th from 10 until 12. Um, and that's due to Rajo's, Robo's schedule. Uh, he's a busy man. And uh, so uh, I just wanna let everybody know about that. And uh, so mark the 26th on your calendars as the next workshop. And the workshops are kind of becoming workshops, Turner Talks, because not everybody can has got Wi-Fi in their shops, which is an, an unfortunate thing. But um, those of us that uh, can do it, we should be logged in from our shops, uh, ready to do some turning with the SKU. I played around with it at the uh, retreat this weekend, got a lot of catches and, uh, and uh, frustrated the living daylights out of myself, but I started getting a feel for it. Uh, the beating's killing me, but uh, it's just practice is all it is. So uh, Rob will be there to help us with that. Uh, I hope everybody got the email with the application and rules for the Starkweather Gallery exhibit uh, in October. That's gonna be our DAW uh, gallery exhibit. Um, and uh, you'll be able to have up to three pieces in it. Um, and they can come from different mediums. It doesn't just have to be wood turning. It can be wood carving. Uh, it could be general woodworking work. Um, it, it doesn't matter. Uh, you just got to tell them on the form. Um, the gallery will run from um, October 1st to October, where's my notes here? October 29th. Um, the 30th will be... Uh, the day that uh, you pick everything up. Uh, the, the deadline to submit. Beg your pardon? The deadline to submit for deadline it? Deadline to submit is September 1st, but we'd like you to, as quickly as possible, get your forms in so Ken and the Starkweather Gallery have an idea of how many people are competing. Uh, so if you can do that be before the month's out, that would be great. Uh, or before July's out, that would be great. That would really help them get the ball rolling. But September 1st is the deadline for getting it, the form in. And it's $25 uh, to submit up to three items. Um, and I believe it's gonna be restricted to three items per artist simply because of space. Um, if you've never been to Starkwater, what, Starkweather, it's a small place. Um, and they have, they, they've renamed themselves. They're now the Starkweather Art Gallery. So, and for those of you who don't know where it's at, it's in Romeo, Michigan, which is just a hop, skip, and jump up uh, Van Dyke Freeway. Uh, nice little place. Great restaurants in town. And um, Ken's working with the Chamber of Commerce to get a listing of all the restaurants and bars and stuff that are in town uh, for people who want to come in and spend the day there um, uh, before our gala. So, um, and one of the things I'm going to offer if... Um, if you can't, uh, on the day that we have to drop stuff off, which is uh, September 25th, if you cannot, don't think you can be there to drop your stuff off, by the time we get to that point, I'm going to have um, something set up where I can collect up all the art of the people who can't get it there. And myself or some, somebody else from the club helping me will get it out to them in time. Um, we had to do this the last time. Uh, we, had, uh, we did a, a bowl exhibit with them. And uh, I delivered about 29 bowls uh, from different members. So, uh, so anyways, um, that's that's coming up. And I hope everybody gets involved in this. This is a, if you have not if you've not done anything like this, uh, it's a great event. It's a lot of fun, and uh, you don't have to be a, a great artist. I know a lot of people think that they're not they don't do art, and that's not true. Everything we make in turning is art. That's my personal opinion which makes us artists. Um, you know, it doesn't have to have fine carvings on it. It doesn't have to have incredible airbrush scenery on it. Um, it's just whatever comes out of your mind onto that piece of wood. 
And uh, that's the art, artistmanship of it. And that's what we want to see displayed. So if you're relatively new to turning, don't be afraid to submit something. Uh, please don't be. Um, and if you have concerns about that, contact me. I'll talk to you about it. I was very concerned with submitting something uh, at our last gallery. And uh, I ended up uh, submitting something that was more historical than it was artistic. And that is, I made a bowl out of a piece of a beam from a barn that was built in 1885, I think it was. And um, that sold the first night it was on display. So uh, I was very pleased with that. So uh, somebody's got their mic on. Please check to see if your mics are on. And if they are, please turn them off. Jeff. Okay. What up? Somebody one, just asked. one. Uh, yes, sir. Statement though, um, if you're going to put something in the art gallery, it has to be available to be sold. Oh yes, good point. Thank you. It it, it has to be available to to be sold. And uh, you know, a lot of pieces get sold. It, it's amazing because it's going to be on display to the public for the full month, and uh, so uh, people will want to buy. Who Thank prices you, it? Beg your pardon? Who prices it? You do. You do. And then I think it's our, uh, Stark Weather takes 30% and you get 70. Yes, the commission of 30%. So for instance, the bowl I put in there was an $80 bowl. And, um, you know, PCAC, uh, where we had it at, they did, uh, they, they took their percentage out and I got the rest. So, uh, so it's up to you. If, if, you, if the piece you turn you think is worth $100, or if you, the piece you turn you think is worth $500, you put on there what you think it's worth. And believe me, don't think you're overpricing it because um, people respond to higher prices. They, 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 in their minds, you know, art isn't cheap. And uh, when I started increasing the prices in my craft shows, I started selling more stuff. I mean, like twice as much stuff. Um, you get respect from that. So, uh, so yeah, you set the price and they will simply advertise it with that. So if you did not get the email for whatever reason with all the rules and everything, please contact me uh, by email or by text and I will send those out to you. You can also, if you've got any questions about the gallery uh, and about the whole thing, um, the forms that I sent out have Ken Krenicki's contact information. He's the one's putting this all together. Please feel free to call him or write him at any time. He's more than happy to take, take your calls. Uh, any questions on the art gallery? Hey, Jeff. Yes. Uh, I just had one more thing to add. Um, the completed application uh, has to be in September 1st, but if uh, they, they could send me a blank application um, because a lot of people don't know what they're going to enter, you know, early on. So if they just, it, you know, send a check and a blank application with their, you know, most of the information that they have, and then um, September 1st and I'll put an updated application with all the, uh, the, the, you know, essentials that, uh, of what they're entering. And that way, uh, at least we know that we have people that are, signed in and, and um, on board, um, if that makes any sense. No, it does. And, and, and thank you, Ken. I didn't realize you were on today. Yeah. And, uh, and Rod, Rogers, Rogers, my sidekick. So um, he's, he's, uh, he's involved in this also, but uh, uh, most of, for the most part, if someone has questions, they can call, uh, call me at any time or email. And, um, you know, I can answer the best I can. And, uh, go from there so what is the address you send the check to uh, it's it's on the application form um there's there's a, there's two two sheets there's an application form and a uh, eligibility rule form and i i believe it's on it's on um the application form and then yeah i'm looking at the form right now so um, the bottom of the of the uh, application form should have the information and then the other one has my phone number and my uh, email on the uh, other page for uh, eligibility okay i am not seeing an address for stark weather oh does she want stark weathers or my address is that uh, we send it to you is that the yeah. address yes. okay 
Yeah, the uh, yeah your address is on the application form. Yeah. And uh, right the down reason, here at the bottom. Yeah. And the reason we did the two forms was because uh, prior we had everything on one sheet and people were sending those in and then they didn't uh, have the <laughs> the rules in front. You know, anyway, it, it, this, this avoids a lot of confusion. Yeah. Um, no. And uh, so anyway, that's about it. And uh, yeah, um, like I say, everybody that was in before, um, they, they know the, the game. Um, and uh, well, that's it. So I'll let you. I'll let you go on. Okay. Thank you, Thank you Ken. Yeah. Ken's done this before us before, and he's always done a great job. So I'm really looking forward to this event. It's going to be phenomenal. Um, so that really sums up all my announcements and everything. Does anybody have any questions or comments about anything that I've covered so far? Make sure you unmute your mic. Okay. Uh, I think it's time then. Uh, Robo, are you ready to get started? Uh oh. No, I'm right. Right. Jeff. Okay. Can I just, can I just ask? Can I just ask a favour, please? Would you like to do the president's challenge and everything now? Okay. So that it's sort of an open-ended meeting because I'm not sure if I can get it down to an hour or not. So Okay. So you want me to go through the rest of the stuff and then we'll do the demo as the final item? Yes, please, if you wouldn't mind. You got it, my friend. Thank so, you. So then, that puts us, the next thing is the tool review. Does anybody have a tool they want to uh, talk about and uh, show us? I bought a lot this weekend. I'll probably show them off next month. Uh, they're not even out of the box yet. Going once, going twice. Are we going to have show and tell at the end? Um, well, it sounds like we're going to do show and tell before the demo. We're going to do all of our normal stuff. Okay. Why don't you do the, something else? I'm going to run downstairs and get my tool to show. Okay, we got we got a few minutes to go before that. So okay, okay, okay. Um, we're oh. still uh, we are. Uh, oops, I gotta find me now. Okay. There we go. Um, we still have tickets for sale for the Longworth rat, uh, Chuck. Um, the ticket sales have slowed down. We still got more to sell. The tickets are available at our members only site. Um, if you don't know the password, if you're a member and don't know the password, contact a board member and they'll tell you. And all of our contact information is on the club info tab um, of the website. I would like to get tickets sold and I'd like to get this thing moving out so we can move on to the next thing. Uh, because believe me, they are fantastic. Uh, Cindy's done a really good job at making these. Uh, I'm, I'm, I, I'm I'm getting a lot of use out of mine. So, uh, yeah, I'm back, Jeff. What's that? I'm back. Okay, very good. Okay. This is um, my version of the Longworth. Yeah. That's this it. is 19 inches across. Yeah, let me, let me hold, keep holding it up there. Okay. I'm trying to spotlight you. There we go. Okay, this is my my Longworth. It's like I said, it's 19 inches across. And it took me, I did it by hand. This is my second version. The first one I screwed up really bad. Mm -hmm. I couldn't, get, I used a trim router instead of my big size. And it took me about two and a half hours to make. And I made this out of MDF to try it. And I will probably make another one out of plywood. Okay. And I got these uh, the bumpers at a wine store on, in, uh, in Plymouth and Livonia. They were $1.65 a piece. Yeah. Buy the okay. cheese. This, this, I'll and put it on the Excel file. Okay. Okay. Who's ever got their mic on, turn that off, please. Um, Okay, let me hold up uh, an example of what Cindy's is. Um, 
I'm going to turn off your spotlight. So this is an example of Cindy's. Um, and basically, if you win it, uh, she'll ask you which type of faceplate you got. And she will, uh, and she's got that design into the CNC to automatically to do, to do the screw holes for you. And um, I think she started out, they were going to be 10 inches. They're going to be 12 inches now. So this is her prototype. This is one of the second ones that she's made. And uh, I just got the wooden parts for her and I, I did everything else. They're fantastic though. Um, you'll love it. Absolutely love it. Jeff, I, I find that I use my Longworth much more than I do my vacuum chuck. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, one thing I've, I, I've used the Longworth for is uh, I've got a couple of bases that I didn't like and, uh, you know, I parted them off and threw them off in a corner. And the more I think about it is, you know, I should see if I can remount that. And I used the Longworth to do that because they're not, they're not, uh, they've moved. They're not perfectly round anymore. And the Longworth is great for just lining everything up and getting the glue block onto it. Yeah. Um, so uh, those nice long buttons, they make all the difference in the world. So, so I used the number six um, um, rubber cork for mine. Okay. So it's about an inch of cross on inch, inch and a quarter on the top and an inch on the bottom. Uh -huh. And it will, it will handle anything. Just, uh, just one, one. one note on the Longworth or the vacuum, do not turn over 1,000 RPM. No, actually, it, it shouldn't be over 600. Okay. And I will say that simply because of the accident I had with uh, my coal jaws and uh, uh, the ball came off and hit me in the head, if, for those of you who remember the, that back in 2015. Now, that's when I learned so that's never, what hit. never so to that's turn what over hit. 600 RPM on those. And that means very light cuts when you're taking the, the tenon off and so on. Yes. So any questions about the uh, the um, the tool raffle, the long work truck? Okay. So I'm gonna go on to the Facebook challenge. Get my list out here. We had 21 people in the Facebook challenge which is pretty good. Uh, it's, it's warmer weather, so things are slowing down uh, quite a bit because people are doing things now. And the fact that we can go out and do things is just amazing. So I am going to set the number 21 into my handy dandy number checker. And I'm going to hit select. The winner is number 10, which is Kathleen Gardner. You winning a gift certificate from Craft Supply. Thank you. Congratulations, Kathleen. Thank you. One of the things we're trying to work out is Craft Supply may be getting rid of their gift certificates. Uh, they're going to make a decision in January, uh, July sometime. Um, a lot of people are up in arms about that. A lot of us presidents that they work with. Um, it's, it's funny because the owners of Craft Supply says it's a money losing proposition uh, because we lose whatever that percentage is every single time somebody uses it. And the workers there are saying, you're idiots because people who use those certificates buy two, $300 worth of stuff. So, so they're arguing over it and I'll let them argue over it. Whatever their decision is, I'll let you know. And we will come up with something else to take the place of that. So next is our president's challenge. So let me uh, share my screen here. Oh, that's not what I wanted. There we go. Too many buttons to press. Let me start off by apologizing for the mix up in my letter on the president's challenge. Uh, I was in a hurry to get everything out before I headed out to uh, um, the retreat uh, because the board meeting was the night before I went off the retreat. So after I finished the board meeting, I had to work on all this uh, and then finish it up last night. So, uh, but um, 
Ben was gracious enough to get a, a quick email out to, to update that information. We had a few people posted um, some images of stuff they did from John Jordan's and, uh, and that's what the information I sent out, but we reclassified that as Facebook and they were, they were understanding of it. So let's go through the pictures for the president's challenge. And this was uh, basically embellishing as per um, Mark's demo. And this is uh, Alfred Chambry. That's the inside, just gorgeous work. Everybody just did a phenomenal job. This is uh, Bruce Gruff. I really like this. Cindy Yates. Kathleen Gardner. Was that liming wax in that, Kathleen? Yes. Okay, cool. I really like that. Thank you. Lowell Gannett. Uh, another one of Noel, Lowell's. I like that one. Mark Wallace. Mike Lanham. Nice work, Mike. Mike Lenaway. Uh, another of Mike Lenaway's. Uh, this is uh, one of those ones with the metallic paint, which is really cool. And for those of you who love Eddie Van Halen, this is Paul Schultz. Looks a lot like Eddie Van Halen's guitar. And there's another view of it. Paul Zirkel. And that is it. So let me get out of the share. Let me update my number checker. So that was a total of 10 people that uh, submitted. There we go. Okay, let's turn it around. And our winner is lucky number 10, Cindy Yates. Cindy Yates has won it. She'll get a, uh, a gift certificate from Craft Supplies. So thank you everybody who posted, uh, uh, keep up the posting. And the president's challenge for next month for July will be, um, will be uh, something that you created with the SKU as per Rabo's demo today. So let me check off my list here, Facebook. Okay, so let's do show and tell then. And I will go first, and then uh, when I um, when you have something to show, let us know who you are. Glenn or I will find you and, and spotlight you. We were talking a lot about Campbell's hands-on retreat, and uh, one of the things that I've never done before was pyography, and so I took a class on that, and that's what I made. Um, she gave us silk maple leaves that we had to outline, draw an, uh, trace an outline of the pencil, and she made it difficult. It had to go over to the other side too. And then we just uh, took typography pens and outlined it, created the veins, and then she showed us coloring with um, paint pencils and alcohol and a Q-tip to blend it all in. So uh, that was my first experience with pyography. I was really, really pleasantly surprised. The second one was making a hummingbird house. And the, the big thing for this was, this is what got me hooked on airbrushing. So um, this was a lot of fun to do. The base colors are yellow and green. Um, and then all of these splatters you see here are black India ink and um, uh, iridescent white India ink. And you put a drop on and then you just spray with air from your gun. Just give it a little blast, no paint. And it blows it out into these patterns. And it's really cool. And then uh, the bottoms and the top was, um, was airbrushed uh, with a real heavy black. And then in my case, I did gold um, gilding cream 
on it that I just put on with a um, foam paintbrush while the lathe was spinning. A um, lot of fun. This, I mean, took me 30 minutes to make this thing and that was the first time. So I'm already thinking ahead for the Christmas craft shows. Uh, so anyways, that was my introduction to airbrushing and that, that got me hooked big time. Uh, Glenn, you got your hand raised? Okay, let me go over to Glenn. Okay, Glenn. I also took one of the pyro pyrography classes and this is the, um, we first learned how to draw a flower. And uh, so this is a flower that uh, we all ended up drawing ourselves instead of using a stencil. And then uh, we did some pyrography. Obviously we didn't have enough time to get uh, everything done, but I brought it home to play with it a little bit more and uh, learned a lot, learned a lot. I mean, I had a, a pyrography machine and um, different tips in that. And I messed around with doing some texturing and stuff like that. But uh, first time really, I tried to actually make a picture and uh, came out pretty good, I think. I'm pretty happy with it for the first real try at doing a picture, so. Very good. Yeah, it was fun, wasn't it? Yeah, but a lot of fun. I was really surprised by uh, by my biography. It's one of those things, uh, there's a lot of things I'm afraid to try. And so it just takes me getting into a class like that and a really good teacher who has immense patience, which everybody did. So. Okay, um, anybody else got show and tell? I know Paul does. Want to go next, Paul? I didn't have anything to show. Oh, I thought you said you did. I'm sorry. No, I showed the, you know, the long work. Okay. Anybody else got anything for show and tell? There's not. I got a tour of you if you still want to do one. Oh, sure. We'll take a tour review. That's show and tell. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> so I have a very hard time using rattle cans because I can't uh, push down on the button with my fingers. I found this uh, trigger thing at made by Rust Oleum at Home Depot. It's very slick. It clamps on to your rattle can, and you can use it just like <clears throat> pulling a trigger. It's eight bucks, and for me, it's worth more than eight bucks because I can now spray paint something with a rattle can using my crappy hands I got. Ah. So uh, I've been using this for the last couple of weeks. I bought two of them and uh, it's quite accurate. And I think it sprays a lot better than holding the uh, button down with your finger, but uh, it just gives even pressure all the time. So uh, if you have trouble, like I do using your hands, this thing is really great. Home Depot, eight bucks. So do you, buy press, a do you press those two little fingers to get it onto the can, lock it on? Yeah. Oh, that is so much better than the old designs. I, I yeah, sprayed myself so many times with the old designs. <laughs> it's it's just a, a little squeeze clamp here. And the clamp spreads and it goes right over the uh, lip on the can. Okay. And you'll see I got a little paint on here because I had the, um, the handle off to the side when I shook the can and I didn't line it up right to squirt. So I squirted the inside of the trigger, but it's really simple. Now, do you on. know if that works with other cans of the, uh, rather than Rust-Oleum, other brands? Well, it, it doesn't, it doesn't have to be, as far as I know, it works on any rattle can. Okay. Uh, I asked the, um, one of the Home Depot employees that was there and uh, uh, to me, it looks, he said, he was quite sure it works on any rattle can because they're all pretty much made the same. Okay. And and this clamp is uh, self-adjust. So. Okay. Um, Question. Uh, I'm thrilled to death with it, and uh, I'm glad I bought two. I'll probably buy a couple more. But okay. um, it, it worked for me. Someone had a question. Yeah, uh, Dave. Do you, how do you clean it after you're done with it? 
Well, if you're more careful than I am, it's really not hard to clean because the nozzle comes right out between the clamp. But what I did, I painted the inside of the can. When I shook it, I got the handle off to the side and I sprayed the inside of the handle. But normally, if you're a little more intelligent than I am, you don't have that problem. You just make sure the that the uh, hole is aimed out to the center of the clamp, and it shouldn't. Uh, I've used this on three or four different colors, and I, I, other than this black, I've not gotten any paint on it, and it wiped right off. I just washed it off with hot soapy water, and it was fine. So there's no paint on the clamp itself, and I've used it. Uh, well, I've this is my second can of paint I've used this handle on. And I've not gotten any paint on the handle at all. No, I, I re more referring to the uh, to the nozzle. Once you put the black paint through it, you know, you used oh. to be able to tip them over and and spray upside down to clear them. Yeah, no, I don't. That's not a problem. See, there's the can, there's the nozzle, and I just uh, I do what you just said. I just turn the can upside down and give it a squirt. And uh, uh, the, for the most part, I take a paper towel as soon as I'm, done, as I'm done using it and wipe off the tip. And I don't usually have a problem with the uh, nozzle clogging up at all. So, but it, it goes on very simply. It's hard for me to do because of my hands, but it slips right on there. I'm not going to do it now. There we go. And um, if you can do it, anybody can, right? Th that's right. That's right. <laughs> and if you really have a problem with the nozzle, just take the clamp, just take the trigger off, and you can clean it up like you normally would. But I just turn it upside down, give it a squirt, and then wipe off the uh, hole with my uh, with a paper towel, and I don't get it clogged up. So, yeah, no magic to it. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks. Anybody else got anything for show and tell? I do. Okay, Sandy, let's find you. Okay. I know you're here somewhere. Oh. There you are. Hello. Okay, you are spotlighted. Okay. So I took Greg, uh, Greg, um, What's his last name? Um, anyway, his class at the retreat, and he calls them podlets. So this is, I've never done anything that thin. So this is my little podlet oh, wow. that I did. So so it's it's like a little flower, and, and you put it in the microwave, at, and you, you turn wet wood, and you put it in the microwave, and you weigh it down, with a, a bottle of water and, and you create this bow in it in the microwave for one minute. Interesting. Yeah. Now, when you turn that thin, did you have your finger behind it for support? Absolutely. Yeah. That is cool. Yeah, it was, for me, it was a little scary because I thought I would catch my finger, but actually you take such light cuts. It was a good exercise in light cuts. Yeah. 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 I learned a lot about, about light cuts this weekend. I'm a bit heavy handed. So, uh, <laughs> me too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. Anybody else got anything for show and tell? Uh, Jeff? Yes. Dennis, uh, I guess I'm, I guess it qualifies as a tool. Okay. Let me spotlight you. Okay. Uh, I did this bowl. Oh, here we are. It's a, I think, Osage orange. It was literally a log that had been sitting around the shop, and I got tired of tripping on it. <laughs> so I decided to try a natural edge bowl, and then I came to wanting to do the foot, and it became a challenge like, okay, no, Chuck is going to grab this. So what I did, I guess this qualifies as a tool, I got a piece of... Uh, board from actually it's an old desk drawer 
And uh, you can see I've been using it as a backing plate for drilling. Mm -hmm. I drilled a cup into the bottom so I could mount it on my Nova chuck. Oh, so with this, with this angle, it approximated at its engagement point the interior angle of the bowl. And you can see I have four little neoprene dots on it that I just glued on. So while it's in the chuck, which I'll give you that here, and this is my original Nova chuck. So it's a legacy chuck, but I still use it. So here it is, you can match it on the lathe. And then you put the bowl in and that engages it. And then at the back, I just use the live center by tailstock to turn the detail and I had a nib in the bottom, which I just carved off. So that allowed me to turn the foot of a natural edge bowl the same as I do all of my other ones. Great. And that's, so it's, that's proof it's positive that, you know, we're turners. We can make our own tools if necessary. We don't have to go out and spend hundreds of dollars on things. Yeah, I suppose there's probably a cup you could put on a uh, vacuum chuck to do that. I don't have a vacuum chuck. Uh, this is cheaper than a vacuum yeah. chuck. Or maybe that's your million-dollar idea. <laughs> yeah. That's proven not to be the case, but it's all by problem. Yeah, for that instance at least. So I just thought I'd share that since we're talking. I hadn't intended on bringing it, but then I thought, well, maybe that qualifies as an idea. Well, no, I'm I'm glad you did share that. I think some of our newer members and people who are newer to turning need to see things like that. Uh, there's a way to solve almost any problem you come across. You just, uh, yep. sometimes you have to think about it a little bit, but you know, just put some thought into it. Um, I'm working on uh, something right now. In fact, I'm going to do the drawing for it. But uh, if you ever use those Excalibur circular chainsaw type carvers, I've not uh, used them, I've seen them. They scare me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I know why, because I, I have a bowl I'm working on I, since last year, actually. Um, and uh, it's going to have sort of a scalloped edge. So I left, I turned the bowl with about an inch and a half thick wall. And I drew my design on it. I start using that, which it removes material very quickly, which is a big plus. And that's a big minus because it has no, uh, no behavior uh, limit on it. it. Once you get going, it wants to pull itself right into the wood. Yeah. I mean, it, it acts like a chainsaw. So I'm coming up with a way, which I hope will work, to put a limiter plate on it. So I only cut down about an eighth of an inch. And then as you tip the granular that you put it in, it'll shave or whatever you want. So if that comes up, I might have something for our next show and tell. Okay. Another handmade tool, but. Great. Because I looked all over on the internet thinking, well, someone's come up with this already. And no, I can't find it anyway. Has, has anyone else seen something like that that would help the behavior of that Excalibur, or no, Sir Lancelot, that's what it is, yeah. Sir Lancelot. Yeah. I, I've not seen anything that works with the Sir Lancelot. What I've seen a lot of people do is instead of using that particular device, they're using the saber tooth disc, like Bob cell, because okay. uh, apparently it works, they say it works as well and it's safer. Um, oh, maybe, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I just... James Hamilton early last year was using one of the, uh, one of those um, chainsaws. And he even admits he was using it wrong and he was going down and uh, he uh, went farther than he should have without shifting his body and it caught and rode right up his hand and tore his hand up real bad. Oh, And it, it, he even showed the video. It happened so fast you didn't, you couldn't see it happen. Yeah, that's... And, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a scary, scary tool. The guys that use I, it, my hat's off to them. <laughs> They're amazing. <laughs> no, my, I, <laughs> So, hey, Jim, like, Jim, Jim Strohmeyer here. I, okay, Jim, let's find you. I think I got my camera off. Let me go ahead and start it back up. Uh, okay. I had uh, a couple of years ago, I was up at the uh, wood carving show at, at, at Ever, not a show, but a whole workshop. And uh, one of the gentlemen that's there is an instructor, but he he's a professional chainsaw carver puts on demonstrations and we were talking he said those little chainsaw things he said do not use one 
he said he's seen more people get injured with them. They're they're extremely, and he he does chainsaw stuff for a living. And he says, <laughs> "Don't go near him." I can understand uh, that. Yeah, you know, and I I, I did I, get oh. one, and it's supposed to be anti kickback, but you got to be super. But I like the idea of some of the other things that you get now. They're the Kurtzall. Uh, and so they're, they're saber tooth things and they can get them in different sizes and grits uh, yeah. are a whole lot safer to use yeah. than, the, than that. Cause, and, and even when I did use mine a little bit, I make sure that the guard with my, my uh, uh, angle grinder that the guard is on, the blade guard is on. Oh so yeah. That it, oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So that I'm only, even the blade guard can help limit, what it can get to but yeah. uh yeah. Yeah. yeah and you gotta you gotta just barely touch it with that thing because it, yeah it's uh yeah well, that's why they're, they're ugly <laughs> i think i think the rule of thumb that i like to live by is that there are safer tools but there is no such thing as a truly safe tool uh any tool will get you if you're not using yeah. it right um yeah. <laughs> you ever stab yourself in your screwdriver yeah <laughs> yeah uh, I heard, uh, uh, I can't remember the gentleman's name, but he was an old timer and he'd been wood turning for about 50 years along with all his other, he built furniture and stuff too. He says, of all the power tools in my shop, the only one I can safely say will kill me is a lathe. <laughs> and I thought about it and it's true. You don't get a chance to react. And, and I saw the video that was uh, made, that, of that young man in Siberia. They got got his coat caught, and it's not a pretty thing to see. Uh, it's been taken off the net, as a matter of fact. Um, oh, good. So, um, yeah. No, it, uh, well, anyway, that's that's uh, what I had to offer for today. Was okay, little, I appreciate it. Block right. of wood. <laughs> Great idea. I appreciate it. Thank you. Anybody else got a got show and tell or a tool? Uh, Jeff, I have a quick question from anybody on on the site. Okay, let me get let me get to you real quick here. Okay. There you are. There you go. Okay. When you get a log, and if it's cut in the winter or cut in the summer, which one, which season is a bark going to stay on? Hmm. Anybody I know want? the answer to that. Okay. Okay. So the class, one of the classes that I took spoke about that at the retreat. And if it's cut in the winter, it'll hold its bark so much better than if it's cut in the summer. Yep. They said because the sap that runs down um, is out of it, and so it holds its bark. I heard that it's because that in the spring, and this is how I remember it best, the bark becomes somewhat pliable and loose so that the tree can add the next ring. Okay, so that's when, if you cut it then, the bark is prone to fall off. Well, almost certainly, well, certain species, of course, won't. But anyway, the bark will be more likely to fall off if it's cut in the spring. That's the growing part of the season. So spring and summer, you're gonna lose the bark and the winter, you're gonna keep it. Yeah, winter sander is dead right. That's that's the reason it's not yeah. uh, dragging up water or anything. In fact, it's losing water because it doesn't need it. So the bark will stay on longer. Well, thank you, everybody. Okay. Yep. Any other um, show and tell or tools? Uh, if not, then our final thing. Uh, before we get to Robbo, will be questions and answers. Anybody, uh, just like Paul just did, uh, anybody got any questions I need an answer for? I do. Okay, let's get to you real quickly. Mm -hmm. Oh, I don't know what I just did here. Um, there you go. Okay, in the um, class for uh, Barbara Dill, in, in um, the multi-axis class, uh, she used a, a live stab center that was very narrow and it had and very strong spikes that she even filed down even more to grab. And I think it was like half inch or or maybe smaller. Does anybody know where I can get one of those? 
Well, my advice would be to go to the various different woodworking tool sites like Craft Supplies, Packard, Highland Woodworking, uh, and, and search on their site for a stub, stub center. Uh, I've got sorry. to. Sorry, Jeff. No, I, I'm, I'm trying to get carries, back to uh, my gallery view here so I can highlight me. Um, oh, that's not right. Hold on. I've got one of those, but it's a dead center, not a live center. And it's real small, like you say. Yeah. Yeah, they're but not I a live center. They're, they're a dead center. I can't recall where no. I got it. Stab, stab do make one. It's three right. eighths. Three eighths or 10 millimeters. Yep. And Who's, uh, Robo, can you say that again, please? Yeah, it's a stab center. You're right. And it's a three eight or 10 millimeter one. Yeah. This, yeah, is, this is the one I use. This is, uh, I think this is classified my, as a half inch. And it's, so it's got the little, I'll get up here. It's got the little teeth around the edge and it's got a, uh, let's see. It's got the little point in here that's spring. Oh, mine's not spring loaded. So anyway, it's got the little point in the center and you can actually remove that point on mine, but that's a step center. So the three eighths one, where was that at? Who sold oh, that? Probably, I, I don't know in America, but I would say that you'd get a craft supplies or any wood turning yeah. shop. That's my oh, that's advice: right. is go to the different uh, wood, woodworking and wood turning stores online, and, and you will find them. Uh, another thing: a lot of times, if I'm looking for a tool and I don't exactly know what store to go to, because some stores will have better prices than the other, I go to Google. And for instance, I'll put in half inch step <coughs> center, and it'll pull yeah. up all the different places that are selling them. Rattler has it. It's Rattler a revolving. It. It's a revolving center. Revolving tile stock center. Okay, just a minute, Dennis. I'm going to highlight you. Thank, there thank you, everyone. Yes, yes, that's yeah. what I'm looking for. Yeah, yeah, it's got a spring center, too. Yeah, See, it's got. That's a, that's a drive center, not the tile stock center. Right, yes, you're right. So it's not a live center, it's a dead center. It's a number two Mars taper. Yeah. yeah. So it doesn't move. No, that's right. But but they have it in three sizes in tile stock centers as well as the drives the drive centers. Okay. There's three eight, seven eights, and inch, I think. Or inch and a quarter, maybe. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Right. Anybody else got a question? <laughs> Last call. Okay, Robbo, I'm going to find you and highlight you. And uh, I'm going to also, I know you're here somewhere. There you are. Make sure you are a co host because you'll need that. Um, and uh, oh, I don't want to do that. Um, hey, Robbo. Yeah. When you had it on the tail stop cam, he, he, I think you moved it. Yeah, I, I was just going to be straightened up a bit, that's all. Yeah, just pull it back towards you a bit. Yeah. Right, yeah. We're right to go, are we, Jeff? It's all yours. Thank you. And um, thank you for doing that. And to the members as well for being so patient. But I sort of. Got a funny feeling this is going to go for a while because I'm going to get a heap of questions, I hope. So, right. Now, the first the first thing with spindle turning is that you've got to find the centers. Now, because I'm a production turner, most of our timber is machined square all round. So uh, we just machine it ourselves or it comes in machine from the client. So the first thing we do is mark a center. Now I realize that this will be sort of telling you how to suck eggs, but there's a few ways to do it. You can just get a rule like this, or a straight edge, it doesn't matter, and just mark across in there like so.
Now you can also use a finger gauge so that you get a little square down in the center here and then you just go corner to corner in the little square. The important thing to remember in most cases is to put a little pop mark in the middle. Now, whether you use a center punch, I like these spring loaded ones the best and just put an art mark in like that. Then of course, we've got the proprietary bands, which are these jiggers here. They work really, really good. And you just do the same thing. You just mark a line across on each corner like so. My favorite method is with a marking gauge, particularly if I'm doing furniture legs, because you've got to be really accurate in the center. So what I do with a marking gauge, set it on the center, mark all four like this, and the pin, there's a little hollow in the center because it gets done four times naturally, and you can just go straight in there. Ah, come on. Now, if you've got a hundred of something to do, and there's going to be some comments about this, you use what I call a bonking board. It's a set up square about uh, <coughs> 10 millimeters, five to 10 millimeters bigger than the bit of wood. So that you can rotate it around to the side and you go bonk. automatically marks your centre, you don't have to mark it or anything else, it's all done for you. And if you've got a hundred of them to do, it just makes it so quick and easy that it's uh, out of this world. Right, so that's the timber centred. I'll just get rid of all this stuff here. Then there is another method that I do use occasionally, and it's called guesswork. After you've been doing it a few years, you can just about guess the middle of it middle of the timber. Now I must apologize, I've got a hell of a cold at the moment. <coughs> I'll just get rid of this stuff here. It's a problem of working in a confined space, I'm afraid. <laughs> we all understand. Right. Now the next most important thing is the height of the lathe. Right, <laughs> now the way that you judge height, I'll just take this camera up a bit, not that high, is you put your, hold on, oh, it's back as far as it's gonna go. Is you put your hand on your shoulder like that and where the crook of your elbow is, down in here, it lines up with the center line of your lathe. Now, if you have a slightly sore back, lift it up an inch above that. <coughs> and if you turn primarily bowls, you lift it up that high anyway. Makes it a lot easier on your back. Okay. What do you do if you're you're too tall for the height of your lathe? Dig a pit. <laughs> no, Cut the legs off. You uh, jack the lathe up. Okay. Um, unfortunately, most manufacturers these days make lathes that are. Um, I think they design them for school kids because they're down so low, like I've had to jack all mine up. Well, I make my own stands on most of them, but the proprietary loads, I've had to put four befores underneath them to mm. lift them up. <coughs> <coughs> right, next camera, this one here. The next thing is your tool rest. Your tool rest must be smooth and free of nicks and anything in it so the tools can slide across it because you're virtually doing a dance on the lathe. 
I've got the wrong tool rest. Wait on, where do I put it? Here it is. <laughs> So it's just a matter of running it over a belt sander sometimes to get any nicks out of it and filing it off. Right, as I said, I use a stab sander for drives. The other thing is I see so many people using cone centers in their tail stocks and the problem with cone centers is that they act like a big wedge and they actually drive it. You've got to constantly keep tightening the tail stock on a big job because it's just forcing itself into it. And on thin stuff, it can actually uh, split it in half. So I never use them. Now, the next thing when you're fitting it in, why not? I'll just see if I can get this camera across a bit more. Wrong camera, that's why. Right. When you're bringing it up, I see so many people too doing this. They're trying to line up their tail stocks <coughs> to get it in the hole. Now, a far easier way is to bring the quill out about an inch that way. Then you can bring the tail stock up until you're fairly close. And you've only got the tail stock, just the, the handle to move. On my bigger lathes, one of the one of the tail stocks weighs 120 kilos. So you can't sort of rock it backwards and forwards too much. So you've got to bring it up close and just use the handle to get it in to the right place. <coughs> The other thing is that I never tighten the lock on the quill until after I've started it. Because what happens is that when you start, there's that jerk reaction. And it's pre pretty bad with um, spur drives, actually, because they bite in further. So consequently, they're loosened. And it's amazing. Like I teach a lot of classes, and they're all told, you lock this down, and then you say, look, tighten your tail stock. So they grab the handle and say, yeah, it's tight before they loosen off the, the quill lock. So I always tell people to leave the quill lock off until you've got the lathe started. Set your tool rest up. Now I'm gonna go against the grain here a little bit. <coughs> I like a finger width between the tool stock and the timber because if you get it too close on some long bevel tools, like that's the recommended distance, three millimetres or an eighth of an inch. On some tools, the bevel is so long that you actually got the bevel riding down on here and when it comes in, when you reduce the diameter, it jumps a little bit. And remember, the turning is all physics, mainly leverage. <coughs> and this is your fulcrum. And this is your lever. The load on this end and force on the other end. Now when you're roughing down, this is a conventional roughing gouge. It's ground straight across like so. Uh, which camera are we on? That one. So it's ground straight across. There's a reason that these are ground straight across, which I'll get onto in a minute. Now there is another form of roughing gouge, which is a European roughing gouge. And that's like this. It looks like a normal spindle, forged spindle gouge, but they're generally pretty wide. Now you can grind them straight across. I prefer this shape, a thumbnail grind it's called. The reason being that if I get knotty timber and I have to turn logs occasionally, I would never use this roughing gouge on a log until it's perfectly round. Because of the knots in the side, the knot can grab this wing or something and just spin it straight out of your hand. Or worse still, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> it snaps the tang because they're very, very thin there. It's all right on the solid ones like the new uh, Carters and um, some of the English ones now. They're machined out of a solid bar. 
not these big ones. They are, they've still got a very, very thin tang on them and they flex and they just break, even doing spindle work. Now, when you're roughing out as well, you never start right at one end like this and just go right down. Take it in little bites. The simple reason, and if it has a crack in it, like I know that this timber is sound, but if you have a crack in it, you can uncover the crack and the whole side of the timber will come straight out at you. So always do this. You can start, I tend to use my left hand because I showed students with my left hand, but always come about an inch. Now I tighten the tail sock again, and that came up half a turn. Then I lock the quilly. Now when you get up to here, you go back the other way. Now, this is the, the most important part of using the chisels. Have a look down here at what my body's doing and the angle of the chisel here. Now, that angle doesn't change and I'm just moving my body forward with it. The tool is actually locked into my body. That's important when you start using the skew chisel. Now the advantage of these type gouges, wait on, I'll get on the other camera now. Is that you can use any part of it. To do any sort of work with it. Now generally the roughing gouge it's virtually at right angles to the lathe, or to the work at least. You can turn it around a little bit if you want to, and have the bevel lead, the uh, flute leading. The other thing that I see a lot of people doing with roughing gouge, oh, the camera, wait on. Now you'll notice that the tool rest is under centre. Reason for that is that I can sit the chisel on the on my hip and without much effort just lift it up and just move it along with no fingers up here at all. I can just use one hand virtually in my body, move it along. Now what I see most people do is this, and that's scraping. So always get the handle down low and just an experiment, take it up high and slide it back until it runs a chip off and it sings to you because the shaving just comes straight off. Okay, now if you want to use it, as I said, just got to check which camera on. Right, that's fine. Now I said before that they were shaped for a reason like this, and this is the reason. Oh, I'll just get the skew chisel for a second. I'll just put a shoulder here. If this was the top of the leg, for instance, and you've got a shoulder here, if you use your round one, like this one here, You're going to take that edge off there. Now the square, traditional roughing gouge, traditional English roughing gouge, you can cut down here. When you get up to there, you can roll it right round to there and just bring the tip straight up to the shoulder. Now you can almost use it like a skew chisel as well. What you do is that you use this part of the chisel here 
set the angle of the, the handle at about 45 degrees. And you can end up with a very, very fine surface on it. Right, I've just got to put a tenon on this. <laughs> right, any questions so far? Hey, Robbo. What yep. do you think the angle is of that, uh, the bevel on that? That's 45 degrees. 45, okay. Yep. All my tools, all my tools are sharpened at 45 with, except specialized tools, which I'll sort of show in a minute. Okay. Now, when you're fitting a tenon on, it's important that you note what sort of interior design the chuck jaws are. Some have dovetails, some are straight. Now, the Nova chucks with their standard jaws are straight. And if you have a look, they have a little lip at the front. Now, I see a lot of people. When they're making the dovetail, now this is going into a, a set of shark jaws. Those, those jaws there. So that's the reason the tenon so long. When you're forming a tenon for a chuck, you do not want it to bottom out in here. It's got to have this, it's got to seat tight against this lip here, this face, the front face. That constitutes 40% of its holding power, believe it or not, having that little step just in here. So the angle between there and there has to be nice and clean and sharp. Now, I see a lot of people with Nova trucks when they get it to there, I'll just put it back on the overhead again. When they get it to there, they put a little groove for the so-called flange to sit into. Now, that is the worst thing that you can do because you actually weaken the tenor. And if you care to read the instructions, there is a big thing about do not put the groove in to take the jaws. It tightens down onto it. So what it does is that when you tighten it and chuck in, the little shape that's shaped like a, oh, like a top of a diamond actually pulls them back into the jaws of the chuck up against that face there. So never put a groove in there. Rightio. So we got that done. <coughs> right. Now, I'm going, normally, I would do all this with a skew chisel, but it's a little trick I learned off Cindy Drozder, actually, of how to show it even better. So, I'll just take this out for a minute. And remove the tail stock center so that I don't put a hole in my arm, which is very easy to do sometimes. Pick on a little short bed laid like this one. Now this is the way I fit chucks. I don't put nylon washers or leather washers or anything else in there. It's always metal to metal contact. I just open the jaws up and I push the Allen key right to the back there and then tighten it up firmly. If you do that, you'll always get it undone. Sometimes it does require a little bit of force. <laughs> and I always do both things. 
particularly if you're working with wet timber. Generally doing twice. Right. Whoa, that's a bit wonky. I don't, I'll just loosen it off a bit. Didn't get it seated properly. That's better. Too busy talking instead of concentrating. Right, I'll just go on to the end camera again. That should give you a good view. Now the roughing gouge sort of looks like this. You can see the angle that it's down there. Bring it up until it just starts cutting. And slide it along. Now as I said, you can use any side of it. As long as where you're cutting is supported by the, the tool rest, you've got no qualms. As I said, I see a lot of people doing this with it and it, all they're doing is scraping with it. I'll just show you the other one as well while we're going. Now, the way I hold the tools is that this finger rubs against there as a guide. It also acts as a break. I shiver every time I see people putting their fingers in underneath a tool rest like that. So you pinch it between your thumb and your forefinger. This is an underhand grip. Pinch it between that finger and your thumb and just move it along. The overhand grip, the heel of your palm here, sorry, the heel of your palm here is what guides along the rest there, and you're just holding the weight down on top of it. And if you use that sort of grip, you don't have as much control if you want to round the end over, for instance. You don't have as much control because your hand's sort of holding it back. But if you come to an underhand grip, you can use your thumb and finger to twist the tool as well as the handle. Okay. Now, the infamous skew chisel. Who'd have thought that a little bit of a bar that's sharpened at one end can make grown men cry? <laughs> But it does. And it's all because people don't understand the way that it works. Now, I'll go back to the overhead camera again. If you are cutting here with any tool, mainly gouges, if you're cutting there, which is the correct place to be cutting just off the tip on each side, If that's cutting there, then it's supported by the tool rest under there. If you start cutting up here, with it supported down on the tool, the tool rest here, it's only got one option, and that's to do this. It will grab. So, as long as you have that Cutting edge supported by the tool rest. And you've got your angles and everything right. It's very, very safe. Start disobeying the rules and you'll come unstuck. Right, I'll just put that one away for a minute now. I'll just point out a few things on the skew diesel first. The skew chisel is the only chisel that has names for itself. This part here 
is called the long point or the toe. This is a short point or the heel. I like about a 20 degree skew angle on the tools. And I always call it the long point and the short point because we have a heel here uh, behind the cutting edge. So it can be confusing when you're teaching some people if you say, oh, bring the heel into contact, they go for that one, when you're actually meaning the back of the, the thing. Now, this is your safe cutting area down here. Anywhere above halfway, you are asking for trouble. We quite often, and I don't, we quite often use pretty well the whole blade to a certain extent, except for about the top three eighths of an inch. But that's us. Now, another part of it, these little pointy bits on the edge here are called shoulders. There's four of them. And they're also a cutting edge, which I'll show a bit later on. But unfortunately, you can only use one of them. Uh, well, I suppose you could use others if you wanted to. Right. Now, as I said before, the gouge is supported behind the cutting edge by the tool rest. The skew is not. The skew is only supported on the tool rest on the short corner and the bevel is a controlling factor in the skew. Now, people say, oh, you put it up here like this and you slide it back and then you lift the handle. Well, it's not quite a lift, it's more of a twist as well as a lift. The handle actually comes up in, a, up in an arc to get in contact. If you just lifted the handle, this is the result. El Cacho. Because it's, you've taken it over the, you haven't brought it back onto the cutting edge off the bevel. Now, if you hear that noise, I hope the microphone picks it up. That chattering noise, that means that you haven't got bevel support. So all you do is you just push it back in a little bit. And move the bevel down onto it. I'll use my normal one now. So it's like any other tool, you have to ride the bevel. Sorry? It's like any other tool, you have to ride the bevel. That's right. Uh, you can get a, you can get away with some tools without riding the bevel, but not many. Uh, gouges are a bit more forgiving than what skew chisels are as far as catches go. Now, when that is called a planing cut, where you're coming across here like this, I'll just put it on the end camera so as you can. Now, <coughs> yep. These two cameras are very close together. One's an overhead and one's actually right onto the end of the blade. Now, you'll notice that I didn't move the tool rest. We keep our tool rest pretty well locked in position all day. So it'd be a pain to have to move it up and down. But if you're having trouble with the the skew chisel, lift the tool rest up a bit onto center line. I'll go back to the end camera again. Now most tools when you're cutting, if you divide this in half across here, and then into there, if you divide it into quadrants. So you didn't know you were going to get a geometry lesson as well today, did you? <laughs> right. If this is horizontal across here, you set, so the gouges, you're cutting about there. 
in the bottom of the top quadrant here. The skew chisel likes to cut up here. It reduces the back force back into, into you. And it seems to like sitting on top and more on top of the work than it does down there where it's not forcing in. So The other thing is that the tool likes to be presented at 45 degrees. This angle down here is 45. That's where it seems to give its best cut. And the reason that you're cutting up here is that if you bring this short point into contact, this is what can happen. It's actually how they do Christmas trees. And on some hard timbers, these will just pull straight out and split it right down here so that you don't get a smooth surface. About the only time that you ever use the short point is the same as with that roughing gouge where you're coming up to the shoulder. So you start here like this, 45 degrees. Now when you start getting near there, you just slide the tool forward a bit and take that last little bit out. Because you've got a shoulder here, the timber can't split past it. <coughs> but yeah, I'll just I'll just show off for a second. Yeah, you've probably seen some of these Christmas trees that look like this. Works much better in wet timber than it does in and dry stuff like this. Okay, doke. Now, as I said, this is a planing cut. The only time that you get a, a catch with a planing cut is if you lift the bevel off at the back. So you'll be cruising along, and if you watch my body, uh, right on, I'll get the other camera on so as you can see. <laughs> watch from here down, if you can. Right on, I'll get my hands out of the way. So the angle stays the same all the way along. So I start at that angle, and the only way that you can do that is by moving your body with it. Right, that's the planing cut. The next cuts we do are V cuts. Now, I have to go on to the end one again. You use the extreme point. If you come down here, it will skip. It'll put rings along it. So you've got to use that extreme point straight in. Doesn't require much force. I'll change the camera angle in a minute. So it's just one cut like that. Now to widen out the V's, you just, I just move the tool a little bit, half a millimetre or a millimetre, uh, 30 second of an inch for you lot. And you just come in from each side. Now there's no need to twist the tool over like that or anything else, just come straight in because the bevel will force it down into the centre anyway. So you're using the bevel but the only part of the bevel that's in contact is the shoulder. <laughs> yeah. 
Now, it is, I never say impossible because somebody will do it. It is very, very hard to get a catch when you're doing V-cuts. About the only way you can do it is if you come in like this. And most of the time, if it's a sharp skew, it'll just take that corner off like that. Now, any questions so far? Oh, the, the pregnant pause. Okay. I, Robo, real quickly, I do want to say, I think somebody's got their microphone unmuted. We're hearing background noise. Yeah, I, I thought it was just my head. Yeah, so please uh, check and make sure you're muted, unless you have a question. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> now, rolling a bead, there's two ways to roll a bead. You can use just the short point down here, and you take this corner off here, and then come back to here, and you virtually just roll the chisel over itself, like that. Back the other way, just take that corner out, come back. And that's how easy it is. The other way of doing it, which is production turning way of doing it, is we actually use the whole blade. Not very good, but anyway. It's a bit pointy, but that's what sandpaper was invented for. Just take the crown off it and it looks okay. Now, a little trick is to get a pencil and put a line down the center, then come one third of the way out on each side. Now, if you look at a hemisphere, it always looks like it's nearly flat on the top at the poles. So you just get your chisel like this. This corner's been taken out. So roll it over and you leave the black line in the center. Now, it'll have a little bit of a flat there, but as I said, when you go to sand it, one bead. Now, this is where most people get the catches when they're doing beads. There's two places you can get a catch. Oh, well, there's three, actually. But what generally happens is that you're coming down around here like this and then you lift the chisel up too much and lose bevel support behind it. That's the reason for the first catch. The other time you'll get a catch is when you get down to the bottom and you overcook it and it comes back. When you come into the bottom of a bead, the chisel should be nearly dead up, straight up and down and it dead right angles to the work that you're doing. The other time that you get a catch is where you're coming down around here and you overcook it back into the next one. Now, I don't know much about American politics, but in Australia, what's happening there is that it's looking for support, like 50% of Australians. <laughs> so, it goes looking for it down there somewhere or back out here. I'm lucky I'm ambidextrous, so I tend to use it. Now, that's a catch. What happened there was I lifted up too quick and just, it got caught. The other thing that you've got to be careful of when you're doing beads, I'm not used to doing them in slow motion, that's my problem. That's my excuse, and I'm sticking with it. The other thing that can happen 
is that you can run into the next one and leave a line around it. I'll come up to this one here and you'll probably be able to see it much better. So you do that to it and you actually leave a line around the bead beside it or whatever it is in there. Right, that's planing cut and beads done, V cuts done. Any questions so far? Don't forget to unmute. Sorry? I'm just telling them don't forget to unmute if they have a question. Yep. Now the next one is a peeling cut. And I'll put you on the end camera for that. Right. Can everybody see that all right? Yep. Right. I might just zoom it in a fraction, actually. Ah. No, how about we... Where are you? Right. Now, a peeling cut is not that. That's a scraping cut. What you're actually doing is lifting the tool down like that, bringing it back until the bevel contacts it. And you rotate towards the center. Great for forming tenons or something like that. Now from the top, it looks like this. Uh, which one's that? Yep. Uh, I'll just check that chuck again. As I said, normally this is all done between center work. Right. So from the top, you start up there like that, bring it back. Now, that removes a lot of material in all very, very quickly once you get used to it. I don't suggest that anybody try the full width of a one inch chisel for the simple reason that it's just too much. Just try half of it, like a half inch. Oh, I did do a good job on that, didn't I? Look at that, that's not what you do, folks. All right? Now, it will leave a little bit of a rough surface there. I use that a lot on lamp stands, but I leave that rough so that the glue has somewhere to stick in it. If you get them, if you get a tenon into a mortise too tight, it just slides the glue off and you've got no glue there. The other thing is that you always take this part up here, you always undercut it. So that it sits around the circumference, not try and get it flat. <laughs> okay, peeling cut. Trim cut on edge. Right. I'll just uh, take that end off. I'm going to find the parting tool. Uh, where do I put it? There. Now, generally, when you part something off, now I'll get a wide one. Never try to force the parting tool all the way in at once. Even if you have one of those diamond ones, they still bind up in the cut. Now the normal result of using a parting tool is that you end up with a rough. A 
rough surface. It's generally all torn in here. The best way of doing it is cleaning it up with a skew chisel. Now the way that's done is that you start here with the extreme point and you're just riding on this bevel here. You're just riding on this bevel here. Now the direction you face that bevel denotes which way it's going to go. If you face the bevel that way, you're going to undercut it. If you face it out that way, it's going to be overcut. So where it goes is in your hands. As I said, extreme point and take a very light cut. And the secret is not to put too much side pressure back into the timber. Because if you do that, you'll end up with ripples. I'll just show you what this looks like now. Smooth as a baby's bum. Now, if you push too hard against the, the bevel contact, you'll end up with this. Probably won't do it because I want it to. Right, I'll just see if I can mark the end of that. It gets a little spiral down it. <coughs> I might just turn this light on for a second here. I know it's a bit bright. No, too much. Uh, yeah. Can you see how you've got a heavier line just in certain parts there? What happens is it bounces off the end grain and it, or it bounces like that off the end grain and leaves little ripples down it. And in some cases, it's a really hard job to get rid of it. Right. Now, now I'll just rip this down a fair bit. Just getting body cam at the moment. Sorry. Ah, oh, thanks, Jay. Now, you can actually see, because I haven't dropped the tool rest down far enough, that the tool is virtually level now in order to get bevel contact with it. So, I'll move the tool rest down again so I can get the angle back on the thing. The tool rest, remember, is the only movable part once you start working. And the height of the tool rest depends on your height, the thickness of the tool, and the diameter of the timber. And that's the only adjustable thing you've got, so use it. Had a knot there, unfortunately. All right, 
That's fix that never happened time. before. No, nah, never, never. Not in a million years. All right, I'll just skip a part for the moment and go and do something else for a minute. Now, the skew makes a great scraper as well. Negative rogue scraper. Uh, I'll just see how it goes with this. <laughs> Put it down now, I can't find it. There it is. Now, use your imagination, please, folks. This is the box. The inside of a box. Now, I've seen people hollow them out with parting tools and various other things. But if you get a skew chisel, I forgot to mention that I like the rectangular skew chisels like this, but you'll notice that I've sanded off the edges so they flow smoothly. Now, a lot of manufacturers now are making them like that with a round edge on them, which are very, very good, except I like a flat edge because I'd mark out with a skew chisel. And I like the flat back so it doesn't rock too much. Now you can spend 80 or $90, if you like, on buying a box scraper. Or you can use your skew chisel. The skew chisel will give you a perfectly perfect straight angle all the way down. Don't know if you can see it or not working in there. And then when you get to the bottom, you move it around like that and start flattening out the bottom as well. Now that's where the round ones actually come into their own because that round part there will bring this angle straight in, the long point straight into where it has to be working down it and you can get a perfectly parallel line or you can buy an $80 scrape, uh, box scraper if you want to. Now, what you've got to be careful of when you're doing that is down the bottom here. See how this is tapered here? That is because when the skew gets down there, if you push, because this is on an angle here, it wants to force it sideways. So you've always got to be careful when you get towards the bottom that you're not going to bottom it out and suddenly make it go sideways. Otherwise, you have the unfathomable, unfathomable conundrum of you can't make the inside bigger than the outside. It's impossible. Now, this is a box. Another neat little trick with the skew chisel. This is actually closed, this one. Now, normally when you're going to fit a lid onto this, most people do this. <coughs> There's a loose fit or the lid won't fit on properly. 
So they get their chisel like this, and they come in from here, and they go down that way, like straight in that way. There is a far better way of doing it. And that is to use the shoulder. Remember I said before that the shoulder was a cutting edge? So what you've got to do is you actually tilt the chisel up on its edge so that this end is free up here. And you line up that shoulder. Wait on, I'll see if we'll get the bigger one. You line up this shoulder here so it's dead where you want it to go. Put it down inside the box and just slide it out, outwards this way. And it takes a micro cut and you can get, you can dial in the lid that way. I haven't met anybody that's good enough to just take a very, very fine cut by plunging it in. But by doing it this way, you can see, you can see how light the shavings are that come off. And you just keep doing that every now and again, stop, start, stop, start, until the lid fits accurately. Any questions so far? No? Right, now we'll go back to spindle mode. Now this is real turning. We have real turning, bowl turning, pen turning, and acrylic turning. And remember always to take the spindle lock off. Okay, look. Now remember, start from one end. What a lot of people, what some people do, you've probably seen them, is they actually run backwards and then run down it. Now the skewer is an interesting beast. It can cut backwards and forwards. Don't run off the end. You can cut beads. Whenever you're cutting beads with either the skew or the gouge, always give yourself room for the end of the cut to go into. 
Otherwise you end up with something like this. See how it's all torn out there? It's the same with a gouge. You always end up with a torn bit of grain on the end of it. <laughs> So we'll do a series of beads down here. This is what I do if I'm working on a club member's lathe or something like that or demonstrating in a club. It's like driving a car. You can have the same model car, but they all behave differently. So I'll do a series of beads. And it gets my brain and hands exercise too. And a series of coves. Now remember, never cut uphill. So always stop just at the bottom. Don't come up the side like that. And don't try and take it all out in one hit. Just take a nick, another nick, another nick, then start your shape. And you just run past the centre line without coming up the top. I do most of my beads with the skew chisel rather than a gouge. Now the skew chisel will also cut a cove. But it's much easier doing it with a gouge and a cove than the skew. Right, now I'll just take this down a little bit to where I wanted the other bit to go to. Any questions on that so far? Yes, uh, when you're um, working the coves and the beads, what speed, what RPMs? Uh, this is sitting on about 2,000 revs, I suppose, for timber this size. I haven't really altered the speed for three by three or two by two. This is 45 by 45. Um, yeah, about anywhere from 1600 to 2000 revs. Thank you. It's all right. Now, when you start getting down thin, you've got to support the timber. And the best way of doing that, this doesn't need any support at the moment.
They can hear it starting to vibrate now. If I run the fingers down, it's got little ripples down it now. Now, the way I support, I just take my hand over the top. I run the timber down those four knuckles there, just off the fingertips. Put my thumb on the on the chisel and sit it down onto the rest. And you pull backwards. Now, when you get up to here, you're going to run out of room. So I just change over to this side and sit these two knuckles down onto there. Or you can sit your hand like that over the top. Now, the reason that I do it that way, I'll just do it while I'm here. If you do happen to slip, the chisel's not going to go through your hand. It'll just poke out there, right? Coming back this way, if I do happen to have a slip, it's going to go up there, out of the way. At least that's a theory. Now, when you get down to this thin, not really thin in my book yet, but anyway, I'll just take another couple of cuts. Now the tail stock is actually bowing that a little bit. So what you've got to do is back the tail stock off a fraction. So that you're not putting any pressure on there. Because the pressure will bow it out. I'll show you that in a minute after I've done another couple of cuts. Now what the timber's trying to do is climb over the end of the chisel. So your hand being there is exerting downward pressure and pulling it back onto the bevel so they can't move. Is that what he showed you to do, Sandra? Pardon me? Is that what he showed you to do? How to get your thin stems? Yes, it, it was, uh, was kind of scary because I didn't really know how to keep my fingers out of the way. <laughs> but I'm learning so much right now. <laughs> You're okay. Hmm? Just seeing if you're okay. It just seems like I haven't heard from you for a while. This is running along. Yeah, I figured that. Oh, well. Somebody needs to turn off their uh, microphone. Yeah. We're hearing some background conversations. But as you can see, you can get down quite thin. I won't keep going because time's getting on a bit. Now, we don't turn off our lights during the day. If you're not confident doing it, don't do it. Right, take this one down the round. Well, is that a pioneer using 
Sorry, why don't? Sorry, what's that? Is that wood a type of a pine? Yeah, it's uh, Pinus radiata as it's joined us now. Um, it's a very, uh, probably equivalent to your pine over there, I'd say. It's a great timber to practice on, like, I'll use real measurements here. For practicing, what we do is get a four by two. Now, I know that's different than your two by four, but, and then rip it down the middle, and that gives us two 45s, or roughly 44 by 45. And that's all we use, like, this is what my students use to start off with. And people say, Oh, that's, you shouldn't use pine for practice because it's hard for a beginner to get a finish on it. That's why I use it because if I get a finish on pine, I can get a finish on anything. Right, so we've got this down to that. We'll take a planing cut down the outside of it. Now to get it parallel, put your tool rest parallel with the bed of the lathe and just run your finger along it. You'll end up with a parallel surface. I don't do that. I just get a parallel by eye, but right. Now, as I said, these are 40, 45 by 45. And I'll give you a couple of little projects that are fairly good sellers at markets and things as well. And they're quick and easy to do. So the first one is a dibber, which I'm sure that most of you heard of. Now, as I said, we don't use a parting tool to mark out with. We always use a skew tool. So we get rid of the crap down this end first with a peeling cut. Just into there. Another one up this end. Now you'll notice that I just put a mark in there first before I start it, so as it doesn't tear out. Now we need a handle on it. About there will do. So, what we've got here is a half bead. and a long taper down here. Now, whenever you're doing a taper, don't try and start the taper up here. Get rid of your waist down here. And you keep lifting the handle as you go up. Leave it about there for that. Come back here, do this half feed here, and a half feed here on the handle. Now, if you get a little bit of stuff down inside here, there isn't any on this. What you do is use the long point and you just sit the bevel against the bead and roll around with it and just clean it up down in there. Now we need inch marks up this. So one inch, two inches, three inches, four inches. This chisel is an inch wide. So to save measuring that, all I do is just get the short point lined up with the one behind it and just put them in. Now some V-cuts.
and you can get a wire to burn them in if you want to. I won't do it today. Or a piece of laminex. Get our gouge and take out this part here into a half cove. Now, if you like, while you've got this in your hand, you could run down and do this all the way down, but I just prefer to use the skew chisel because the next one I've got to buy, use anyway. Just bring it down into there. Now, always, if you're going to cut it off the lathe, always come back to the tail stock first. What you can do is take it down With softwoods, what will happen is it should just sit there and normally compresses just on the end. Now just leave a little bit there until you've sanded it. This is 240 grit paper. In the case of these, always stand that, particularly if you're making it out of hardwood, because in fragile hands like elderly people, they can cut. So just break the corner there a bit. Uh, just define this handle a bit more. That looks better. Now you try to get this cone so that when the final cut goes through, it just comes out like that. Then all you got to do is flick the end off like that. Now you can trim it nicely if you like, or give it a whack with the end of the skew and that'll fix it up. Right, so that's a dibber. Now I did say before that there was another way of uh, putting these in and that's guesswork. Uh, just to prove a point, no centers on this. I'll right, take it down around. Now we're just going to make a honey dip this time. I use various parts of the lathe to get the sizes. I know that that's 35 millimeters there. I need about 30 mil or so for the honey dip. So I'd just come a fraction under that. Again, put our waste part in here. And here. Now I'll pick up the roughing gouge again and just come in a couple of inches off the end here. Leave enough room for the knob on the end there.
Unfortunately, everything in my job is to do with speed more than anything else. Now you can put the grooves in here with the, the parting tool if you like. I just use the skew. So I'll come in about uh, half an inch off the end, three eighths of an inch. Put in a deep V cut. Now I'll try to make the heights in the center there all the same. Does it look neat and tidy? Oh, we went a bit far with that one. Okay, now we round over the end. Now, sometimes when you're doing that cut, like when you're doing an OG leg or something like that, you leave little lines there. I'll just grab another chisel and see if I can do it. Uh, where I got? Yeah, this might do it. See the little, I don't know if you can see them on the camera or not, but there's little lines in there. Just raise your hands if you can see it. I'm looking at all of you on the screen. No. I'll see if I can put them in deliberately. Right, see them now? How about you turn the light off, see if that makes any difference? I'll turn this one off. See the little lines down here? Yes. Right. Now that's caused by that. What happens is that that comes in contact as you're going down around this corner here. The heel on the bevel catches on the shoulder where it meets the shoulder and leaves a little line. There's a simple fix for that. And all you have to do is just grind that, put soften this edge just here, right on that point. And I'll get rid of it. I don't know if you can see it properly in the camera. Yeah. Oh, there can. you go. All right. You just touch it to the grinder and just take that corner off. That way it just rolls around that corner. Now this is where you use the short point. So we're going to put a bit of a knob on this. As we're coming up to there, we're still in the normal place. But as we come up to there, just slide the chisel forward a little bit. And use the short corner to come right into that corner there. Right. Geez, I did a terrible job of that. I'll put another one in there just for the hell of it. Right. Trim it off there. I expect to see better out of you blokes next week. Fortnight at least.
And again, just slice it off with the, the skew chisel. Break that off. Now, if you want to put any finish at all on them, just use That's the way it was supposed to look. Just use beeswax and particularly a scented one because women pick them up and smell them. And uh, it just gives them an idea. Right, right, final other little project for you. Now you can cut the timber back for this one. I'll just cut it all to a standard length. Oh, I'm losing my touch. That'll do. Okay. Now I'm going to take it down to the size of that, which is 32 mil. This is a bag handle. That one there, for carrying plastic bags or string bags, put the handles into there, so you've got a nice thing so that it doesn't cut into your fingers. I'd hate to think how many of those I've sold over the years, particularly when plastic bags were all the rage, but they're slowly disappearing in Australia now. Right, waste on the end. Now, about an inch down, there, then about three inches. As you can see, I'm very concise with the measurements. Going about quarter of an inch there. Quarter inch here. You make it a bit deeper if you want to. Now put a bead in here. Bead in here. Start from the center and put a taper out here. Or you can round it over if you want to, it doesn't matter. Coming back the other way now. Feed on this end. Take the taper down. These actually all used to be made from the ends of balustrading. We used to have a lot of offcuts of balustrading, so I had to find a use for it. And balustrading is uh, 42 mil in diameter and uh, square. So it's a good size to get rid of. Now using a spindle gouge, Make almost a gothic cove in here. Mm. 
By Gothic, I mean that the sides are nearly straight down. Round over these corners just enough so they don't get caught. So it jump back. That's because of the spring loading in the step centre. Very handy for that. Again, just trim up the ends. Again, you can put any finish you like on those handles. Decorate it to your heart's desire. Right, now, just one more thing. Yeah, just one more, Rob, because we do have to wrap, uh, wrap it up. Yep. Yeah, this one's just showing off. Okay. Because I can. <laughs> Now, the main reason that people get into trouble with a lot of tools is that they hold them too tightly. Now, I have it on very good authority that we are not strong enough to squeeze any more sap out of these handles, okay? So don't hold them tightly. You just... You can actually just hold them with your fingertips. Because you're forcing an error. Right, now if you're in a real hurry, you use two at once. <laughs> ah! Missed it. Right. That's enough for me, Lair Eisen. <laughs> well, thank you, gentlemen and ladies, for staying with me for so long. I know it's been a long one. Well, Rob, well, thank you. Now, for the President's Challenge, would you say one of the three items you turned is what we should be turning? Any one of the three. Okay. I do want to say that with the honey dipper and the garden dibble, don't use yep. the parting tool. Use your skew to make the, the grooves. Yep. That's what it's about. Thanks, so Rob. That'll be our president's challenge for next month. And Rob, thank you very much. Oh, and Good also, job. don't try two-handed turning like that. <laughs> None of us are there yet. <laughs> I have a quick question for Robo. Sure thing. Yep. Did you cut a groove in the, the handle for the bags? Sorry. You know, did you put a cut a groove in the handle for the bags to put the bag in while you were carrying it? Yes, yeah, it's uh, it goes around those. That was the coves, yeah. Oh, it goes around the coves. Okay. Yeah, sorry, I'm showing showing the bloody. I think it's a brilliant it. idea. Look, can I have sold hundred. I've sold hundreds of them. Can you could can you hold it back up for a second, Robo? Yep. 
if you like, what I'll do is I'll photograph all three and I'll put them up on the the uh, forum page, all right? Up on the Facebook yeah. page. Okay. 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 Thank you. Thanks, uh, Robo. Send, send me the, the pictures too and I'll make sure they get onto the website. No worries. Excellent Very demo, good Robo. demo, Robo. Very good. Excellent. Thank you. Very good. I'm, I'm looking more forward to getting some skew work in now. <laughs> yeah, how many did we lose along the way, do you know? Uh, let's see here. I'm going to turn about, off the spotlight. About, about half. Uh, let's see. Go back to gallery. Uh, we're at 24 <laughs> right now, so. We went from 34 to 24. You didn't lose half. Not bad. Not bad. Oh, that's good. We've All lost right. more with just, just me talking. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Robo. And again, thank you to all of you for uh, for having me along and um, also for sort of changing the format of the meeting a bit. But I didn't want to sort of have to miss out bits and pieces if I, if I could avoid it. Well, no problem. We're very flexible. I've heard that. <laughs> so everybody, that is our meeting. Um, so you've got the president's challenge for next month, turn one of the three items. Uh, I got a crazy week ahead of me, but my goal is going to be to get this video up on YouTube in the next two to three days. Uh, then you'll have it to reference. Um, any last minute questions before we sign off? Okay. Thank you, Mike. Huh? Oh, Mike put the uh, thank you in the chat. Okay. So. Radio. Okay. So everybody, thank you very much for joining us today. And again, thank you, Robbo. And uh, stay safe wherever you go and in your shop. And uh, keep on turning and making those shavings. We'll see you guys next month. No worries. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. -bye. Bye.